So welcome everybody to registering for self-assessment and incorporating a limited company. Uh, I'll just make sure it works. I made sure it worked a moment ago, as you probably saw. There we go, it's working. Uh, so first off, it's registering for self-assessment. Back to the holding screen. I'll just explain uh, and say hello. Hello, my name is Mick Dobson. I'm a business advisor here in uh, Winter in Watford. And welcome those of you who are here now and anybody who is watching on Catch Up by having had the recording sent to them. So you who are here now will get the recording sent to you. Um, so this is being recorded as I speak and you'll get that. And you'll also get the slides. Uh, I may well go off slightly, uh, particularly for the self-assessment registration. And in case you're wondering about self-assessment, um, it's there because if you're a company director, you're going to have to do self-assessment. So we've put self-assessment in there as well as the limited company setup, because if you take income as dividend, you will have to register for self-assessment. That's that's the rules. Um, so that's why self-assessment is in here, as well as incorporating a limited company. It's not a major part. Um, it doesn't take long, but it's something you're going to have to do. You may already have done it, in which case, grit your teeth and drink some coffee. It won't take long. So... Uh, as I say, my name is Mick Dobson. This is going to last for approximately two hours. I'll just switch me off. Bear with me. Cool. Uh, this is going to last approximately two hours. I'll take a break around the middle um, and we'll look at the basics of registering for self-assessments to do your own tax affairs, uh, basically to declare your income to HMRC if you're not an employee. So if you are an employee of your own limited company, you can run a payroll, you can run your own PAYE system through your own limited company, but if you're a director taking dividend, you will also have to register the PA uh, for self-assessment and keep your eye on, particularly on the budget, uh, because things change to do with national insurance rates, tax rates, and whether or not you have to register and what you have to declare, all sorts of things. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a bit of a it's not exactly a moving feast, movable feast, um, but the regulations change slightly. Um, I'm trying to make this go forward. There we are. So first off, registering for self-assessment. And this is a good example of how things change because um, we'll look at um, the two sides of registration, self-assessment and the limited company itself. And registering for self-assessment doesn't look like that anymore. We left the slide up because pretty much it does, but not completely. Um, so here I go, going off sideways. Uh, I am going to hit escape and go onto the internet and go through the registering for self-assessment bit, just the point of getting to log in. I'll come back to the presentation and go through the um, the screens you have to fill in because they have changed fractionally, but only fractionally. Um, not <laughs> haven't changed enough to merit spending half a day doing another set of screenshots. Um, but the actual process, it seems to change on a regular basis because last time I delivered this, which was about 10 days ago, the login process to register for, for self-assessment had changed quite a lot from the previous time I did it, which was about a month ago. So I'm going to hit escape like that, go offline. Uh, actually, I'll hit that plus there. Right. So from the Google screen, I'm going to go self-assessment. And you can see there, register self-assessment, because I checked it before I did this. Um, file your self-assessment tax return online. There we go. Let's go for that one. Remember, you are not registering as a self-employed person or a self-anything else. You are registering to do your self-assessment. So this same process applies to people who are self-employed, people who are in partnerships, company directors. It is registering to do your own self-assessment. Um, so once you've got a government gateway login, you sign into it, and then you tell them what your form of income is. And you might be a company director, you might be self-employed, you might be an employee, all at the same time. Um, and the, the system copes with that. But I'll open with file your self-assessment tax return online, which is what we're going to do. If you're self-employed, da, 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 when you can use it, check how to register. There we go. Click how to register for self-assessment. Start now. And that isn't it. Start now is not it. Start now gets you to some questions. If you're self-employed, let's say next step. Uh, have you, uh, you sent tax return? No. Registering for the first time, next step. These questions, by the way, weren't here about a month ago. These are new. Uh, register for your self-employed. Now it says, and again, this has changed. This used to be, you have to scroll, used to have to scroll down to get to it. That, register through your tax account, that's it. 
that's the thing you click to register to do your self-assessment. To my way of thinking, that ought to be the big green button that says start now. But it's not. It says register through your tax account. And if you read it quickly, and it, it, it you, you read it quickly, and you say, oh, hang on a second, register through my tax account. Yeah, I'm self-employed. I work for myself. I've got my own limited company, let's say. Um, I haven't got a tax account. So there's no point in me clicking that because I can't register through my tax account. But that is what you must click. And I'm going to click it now. And you have to sign in using your government gateway. But if you haven't got a government gateway and you haven't got a tax account, your brain goes, whoa, create sign in details. So just I'll, I'll just scoot backwards to just to do that again, because to my way of thinking, it's 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 very relevant. So just go backwards, backwards, backwards. Check out your self-assessment. Start now. Boom. Self-employed or a sole trader or working man company. Next step. I haven't done this before. Cool. That register through your tax account, although you haven't got one. Click. Sign in using the government gateway. You haven't got one. Create sign in details there. If you haven't got one, cool. Click sign in. Put your government gateway in there. Your password in there. Hit sign in. Off you go. New users create sign in details. I will just click that. I won't go through the whole process. Put your email address in. They send you an email to say, is this really you? Then you put your phone in. You create um, dual factor. Uh, <coughs> I can't say it. Dual factor authentication. Um, and then off you go, entering information. And that is the set of screen grabs I've got on the presentation. So I'm going to go back to that now. But ju that's just to let you know, it's not difficult, but it's not it's not where you think it's going to be. So you've got to click on that thing that says register through your business tax account and then create a business tax account. And that's the way you do it if you haven't already got a self-assessment account. So if you're taking income as a company director, um, that's what you're going to have to do. Now I am going to try, um, this isn't working. Right. So, register and file your tax account, how to send a tax return, register online. That it used to be where it was, register online. Um, and it's changed at least three times in the last two months. So bear in mind, uh, it's not overly tricky, but it's not massive. It's, the, the actual process is extremely not tricky, as you will see. Um, but getting to it is sometimes a bit awkward. So um, as with all of these things, give us a call. Uh, the, the contact number, you probably know the contact number. The contact number is all over the website. Um, the contact number is on the last uh, slide or the slide before last of this. Um, ring us up. Uh, and if you ring that number, you will get Leandro or Karen and they will put you in one of our diaries and we'll walk you through the process if you're nervous about it or if it makes no sense or if you're just fed up. Um, we can do a Zoom screen share with you and go through it. So uh, this is where you get to. Registering for self-assessment. HMRC will send you a letter, etc., uh, and you're required to register once you earn over a grand a year. So the sign in or register, this is <laughs> this is the old screens. Self assessment tax returns, self assessment tax returns. Register if you're self employed. Register online. That's what it used to say. Enter it there. Right. Remember, this is where we got to. So you enter your email address. Continue. They send you an email. You click it. Ask your full name. That's my name. Continue. Set up a recovery word. I've used custard. Continue. So this is all um, leading leading up to getting a government gateway account. And that's where we are now. I think they now have, um, besides those things, they have a, a phone link in there as well. That may have changed also. But they did have email and phone. So they've got both those details for you. Um, quite what anybody does if they haven't got a mobile phone, I don't know. Excuse me. Excuse me, I have a cough. Um, so that's the government gateway user ID. That's your number. Keep it. What people tend to do is screenshot this screen. Um, they will email it to you, to the email address you gave at the beginning. Um, so you set the password, remember, and your government gateway user ID is given to you. Uh, and these things you need to set yourself up to do your self-assessment when you're a company director taking income from the company in dividend form, for example. Um, the other thing to note is this is your government gateway user ID 
for that purpose, for you being a person working for yourself and taking dividend, let's say. It is not a government gateway user ID for the limited company. When we do the limited company setup in not long, the company has its own government gateway user ID. So the government gateway account uh, is a, is a, a access to all things to do with the tax system, but it's specific to you. And the limited companies one is specific to it. So you get a government gateway user ID, which you will need at the end of the process. And you will need it when you do your self-assessment at the beginning to sign in and at the end to sign out. Um, as I say, they send you it. But just as a, just as a, a, a point of interest, if you like, as a point of interest, when you do your pass uh, password, when you do your self-assessment, it'll probably be in the January because most people do. Because the deadline is the 31st of January. So people tend to leave it until the middle of January. A couple of things around that. If you contact HMRC, if you hit something you don't understand and you want to contact HMRC, they are fearfully busy in January because you and the rest of the world are doing the self-assessments. There are, oh, I saw the stat the other day, I forget how many million um, self-employed people in this country, a lot. And most of them will be doing their self-assessments in the last three weeks of January. Uh, my personal view is that most of them will be doing them in the last week of January. So if you have a question for HMRC or you need to talk to them, check out this process early so you know what questions there are and you know how it works. It's ever so easy to do it early. Once you've registered for self-assessment, we've got another webinar going through how your self-assessment works screen by screen, what you have to fill in to do your self-assessment. Now, as with all of these things, we're not specialists. Um, I'm a generalist. I'm not a, a, I'm not financially qualified. I cannot give you financial advice. That would be illegal. All we're doing here is showing you a process. We can do the same thing with a corporation tax return and your self-assessment. Can't advise you on what to put in what boxes and what to do with your company and how your company should run as regards to its financial status. We can advise you on roughly what the process, a simplistic view of the process. If you own buildings and lorries, you need advice on how to depreciate them over time and how to make the best tax use of what you've got. But if you've got a simple business, there's you selling product, taking a small income from the business, everything's lovely, then it's easy to do. Um, and that's where we come in. We, we aren't tax advisors. We are advisors on the process, if you like. Uh, so we can tell you how it works. And you're gonna need your government gateway ID to make it work. Uh, they they send you a unique tax reference about 10 days after you've registered and that you need as well. So your unique tax reference, which they send you later and your government gateway ID are the main things. And of course your password. Now, if you forget your password, lose your gateway ID, you can't get in. So you keep trying to get into your government gateway, but it won't let you. Something goes, something's gone wrong with their software. Any of these things, please make sure you know about these things mid-January, let's say, the latest. So log in mid-January just to check you can. Because if you leave it till the last week in January, you can get a new government gateway ID. They'll send you on. You can reset your password, all of that. But if you want a new gateway, gateway ID, they send, they check your ID is correct with your address and they make sure you really are at the address you've said by doing it through the post. So if they do it through the post and you miss the deadline of the 31st of January, it'll cost you £100 because you've missed the deadline, because you forgot your government gateway ID or lost it. So if you do do that, if you do lose or forget anything, give yourself time. Give yourself time to sort out a replacement or get a new password organized or whatever. So we've got our government gateway user ID. Next page. This, by the way, isn't me doing ropey screenshots. It's like this. It's for some reason, it's half a screen wide, the display from HMRC. We're now in register for HMRC taxes mode. Please select. I want to tell HMRC I'm in business. I need to register for a new tax. Yep. Or I want to sign up to use the online service for, for a tax. Which the, So th that would be if you're doing this for the company, which isn't where we are now. But if you were doing this for the company, you could click that one to set up PAYE for example, or to register for corporation tax, for example. This one, we go, I want to tell HMRC I'm in business and need to register. Next. I'm not, I can't click that because it's a screen grab. However, however hard I try. These are the things you can use this service for. Self-assessment, PAYE, self-assessment, knowledge of partner, self-employed business. Self-employed isn't sole trader. Self-employed and sole trader are not the same thing. I, 
I, I, I'm at fault with that as well. I tend to use them as interchangeable terms, and they're not. Um, limited companies um, to set up for PAYE and Corporation Act, these are the things you can use the service for. So if you're working for yourself in your own limited company, you can use this service. Click. <laughs> Following types of business can't use this service. Well, we don't care about that because we've just established that we can use this service. Click. Uh, and to continue with this registration, you must have a government gateway account. Well, we've just gone through that to set it up. Um, so you can't, you can't get that puzzles me because you cannot get to this screen unless you've come through the government gateway. I, I don't, I don't get it. So, um, you can't register to do two different businesses for the same business tax. Anyway, these, these things, that's, one of the nuisances of doing all these things for the first time is you read every screen just to make sure you're missing nothing. But in actual fact, this screen doesn't apply to you if you've got your own business or you're self-employed and you're registering to do your own self-assessment. You just carry on. So you click next. So we've said we want to go for self-assessment. Next. Register. When did you start working for yourself or when did your training allowance exemption cease? Well, when did you start working for yourself? That Now, from here on in, this is a set of screen grabs for a self-employed person who is working not as a company director. Um, the, the difference is minimal. Um, most of the screens are the same. When you get to do your self-assessment tax return, which is what we're registering to do here, but when you actually do it with the deadline of the 31st of January and all that, one of the screens early on, after you've gone through all the registration process and hit there, you know, they send you a fax and they send you an email. When you've gone through all that, a fax, text, they send you an email. You've gone through all that and there's a screen that rocks up and says, what form of income did you have? Were you an employee? Were you a company director? Were you self-employed? Were you in partnership? And you you can tick all of them. if you have, if you you have know, It's not saying only one of those. They just want to know what forms of income did you have? And at that point, you tick the one that says company director, if that's what you are. Uh, and then it takes you off and says, what was the company's name? How much money did you take from the company? It, and just asks you questions. <laughs> that's the self-assessment bit. Um, this is still the registration process. And we will need our NI number, the name and date of birth, and contact details. That's it. That's all you need. So to summarize, we've got part of the way down the line. It's now telling us that we haven't yet done these bits and it's going to take us on to them. And again, this is half a screen wide. That's how it is. And I don't know why, but that is how it is, unless they've changed it in the last three or four days. So first of all, I'm going to go, sorry, I'll go back one. When you tick next, it asks you for loads of information, right? And what I did was I did a screen grab after I put, after I'd upset it. It's asking for the national insurance number. Are you a UK resident? Are you a share fisherman? Are you a land and property business? Are you a lawyer's underwriter? Are you a director? And when you've done this a couple of times, you'll realize that yours is, yes, I'm a UK resident. Everything else is a no. Unless, of course, you do work in the construction industry or an invigilator of exams or whatever. But these things are, they are special cases for some reason. Are you a director? You'd go yes on that one. If you're self-employed as a sole trader, um, self-employed person you'd go no on that one uh, and then your previously registered utr if you've got a utr if you haven't got a utr they send you one after you've gone through this process so and if you don't put everything in the boxes you get lots of error messages having corrected the error messages by going through that and uh, entering no in every box it asks for your home address. Put your postcode in, find the address. There we go, found an address. When, how long have you lived there? Have you lived there less than three years? If you have, they want the previous address. Next. So there we go, got that information. That's cool. Are you a director? No, are you a minister of religion? No, all those things. Um, might be worth saving the whole thing when you get to the end of it or even printing it uh, just because it makes life easier next time because you'll remember what you said. Not crucial, but might be useful. When did you start working for yourself? As I said, this is a self-employed person, not a company director one, the, this set of screen grabs, but the process is pretty much the same. When did you start working for yourself? There's a date. What do you do? Musician I've put there. Anything, trading name if applicable. 
they're just asking for information. That's not a crucial thing. Uh, if you're a limited company, the limited company has its own, obviously, a registered name. Um, but you as a sole trader, that's... Uh, a sole trader's name doesn't have any status in law, so that doesn't matter. Uh, address, is this business address the same as this address? You've got to tick yes. If you don't, you get that. So yes, and they'll let you carry on. Uh, contact phone number, contact email address, next. There we are. We can change any of those if we want to, but that's the information we've put in. It's confirming. And you tick the box that says, oh, sorry, you don't tick the box that says, I do not want to be enrolled for the self-assessment online service because that's why we're doing this. Click. Uh, it's ticking boxes to say we've ticked all those things in. So this is the self-assessment for you, almost complete. Declaration, it's true. If you don't tick that box, you get that. Error, you must tick the checkbox. So you tick that box and then click next and it asks you if your government gateway sign in. Government gateway ID goes in there. An idea when you do this, if you do this for real, at the very beginning, when it gives you a government gateway, copy it because otherwise you're going to have to go and find the email and copy it, or you know, because you're going to have to put it in there. That, then the password, click sign in, which is a strange one because that should say sign out, really, shouldn't it, or confirm. But that is you re entering your details to confirm it's you. And that's it. That's the self assessment process. So that sets you up as a human being, as distinct from the limited company. You're a human being deriving income from the company you own. Uh, and that's that's how it works. One of the early stage questions, which this set of screenshots hasn't got. No, it's not in the screenshots for self-assessment. Sorry, I'm just trying to remember. This is this is a fairly new thing, you see. Um, if you've earned less than £1,000, they don't want to know. Uh, you don't have to register. So... If you register, okie dokie, who's this? Hey, Sabina. If you register, to come to get things set up in terms of getting... No, you don't. Uh, good question. Um, so if you register a limited company to get the bank account rolling, branding sorted, all of that stuff, as you will see when we go through the screenshots of registering for a limited company, one of the options along the way is you tick a box that says, or you, you press a radio button that says, I'm not planning on trading through this right now. So you can set the company up, register it, get the incorporation number, certificate of incorporation, all the gear you need to set up the bank account, the branding and all of that. Um, but HMRC and Companies House won't be expecting any tax information from you until you tell them you've started trading. So you can sit on it, getting things set up and then contact them and say, right, I've started trading now. My first year starts now. So, yeah, you don't have to register for self-assessment. Um, in fact, I think you registering for self-assessment can be... Right. I'm not 100% certain if this applies to company directors. I cannot see why it wouldn't. I know for certain it applies to um, single person sole trader startups. You don't have to register until the October following the year in which you start trading. So your year is April to April. Your company year is whatever it is, depending on when you register the company. That's that's when or, or when you declare it to start trading. But for self-assessment, you go on the government year of April to April uh, and you have to register by the October before your first tax return is due. Uh, so in short, I wouldn't bother registering for self-assessment until you've got everything else organised. Yeah. I do apologise, I've got a cough. That noise is going to continue from time to time. So, uh, yeah, good question though, Sabina. Good one. Right, so that's the um, self-assessment sign-in process. And now my screen won't go forward. There we are. Next, we get to registering a limited company. Uh, so you choose a company name, name and address address. These are the things you must have or you can't proceed. Company name, which may or may not be available um, because it will check. The process will check as well. I mean, how do you check if a company's name is available? Way, way one, Google. Way two, company's house. So you can go to company's house. Um, Actually, I will show you that as well. I'll go off screen, just show you that because it's very, very useful for all sorts of reasons. I'm going to hit escape, go off sideways again, go back to the end of my email address thing and go, if I go companies house in Google, get information about a company, click, start now, click. 
So if I wanted to find, oh, let's go winter. Winter. Click. Winter Business Centers Limited. That's us. And there is Wenter itself and Wenter Impex. What's that? Wenter Innovation Stevenage. That's one of ours. Wenter Services Limited. That's some of the part of the property side. So we've got four business centers, um, 30, 40 employees, um, quite a lot of asset and an awful lot of tenants. <clears throat> so we've set up bis different business names. for different The innovation was a, um, a, a separate, separate project a long time ago. Um, but Wenter was incorporated on the 8th of August, 1983. This is the company's house database. Um, you can find out all sorts of things. Winter Services Limited was dissolved. We stopped using that one. Um, I'll click on Winter. And if you want to, you could find out our filing history. Click. All the details of all the directors, changes of directors' names, new directors coming in, directors going out. Click on the people. It's just the director's information. It's quite interesting, isn't it? This is public data. This is public information. No weird stuff. There's no special search going on here. This is what it is. Uh, you can file information for this company. But if I click that, it's going to ask me to sign in because I'm not entitled to sign in uh, to, to complete information on the company's house for the company. I don't have the uh, confirmation details and the sign-in details, much like the tax system. If you want to file information for a company, you can, as long as you are the company or you've got you know, sufficient information. Uh, you get an authentication code from company's house, and without that, you can't do anything. But that's just to show you that um, uh, ABCD. There we go, ABCD Limited. I've never done this before. <laughs> just to show you, you put in the company name, and it tells you all about them when they incorporated, uh, when they were, when did they, when did they incorporate? Oh, February twenty twenty. Uh, it tells you who's in the company, current officers, Christina Rossi. Uh, this is. As I say, public information, filing history. This is the vaguely interesting bit, though, for all companies, the filing history, micro company accounts. That's a um, that's normal company size. Registered officer incorporation. Here we go. PDF. This is a, this is the incorporation details. This is the process we're about to go through online. This is what comes out of that process. This is what you get. So Christina Rossi. She's got one share. She holds the share. Initial shareholding is her, and that's about it. Persons with significant control is her. There you go. And she holds the shares and controls most of the company. And that's a certificate of compliance um, with the Companies Act. And she's got a share capital of... That doesn't say of a pound. Anyway, she, the company has a share capital. That's the memorandum of association. The, the memorandum of association. Mem, oh, I can't speak. The memorandum of association. This is one of the formal documents. There's three. There's this. There's. <coughs> sorry. There's this certificate of incorporation. And there's the articles of association. And the articles of association of a small limited company are. 17 or 18 pages of company law, how it applies to the limited company. Uh, and it's a it's a standard thing that you accept when you incorporate the business. Um, and I'll show you that when we go through. So back to that. Cool. So we're going to the registering limited company. I thought I'd just show you that because that shows you public information, how many shares there are, the director's, service address contact address that is the registered company's registration at registered address um number of shares shareholding what directors have come and gone that all that stuff that is public information um you 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 need to have a really good reason for it not to be public information in fact that really good reason has to be you you've got to be on a witness protection program of some sort i don't know of another way of doing it so and they ask you questions as you go through you'll see it um so the information that is public, bear that in mind. So if you put your home address as your limited company's registered office, nothing wrong with that. Most people do. But bear in mind that your home address and then the director's service address, which is there where they will contact you, that can also be your home address. And the director's residential address will also be your home address. So there's three addresses involved. The company's registered office, your service address as a director, and your residential address. Of those three, the residential address does not appear on the public record. The other two do. 
the other two are just there. It's just part of the registration process of a UK limited company. So if you want to keep your name and address out of the public eye for some reason, it may be you just think it doesn't look right if your home address is 14 Acacia Avenue, Cheam, South London, you might want something that says Unit 23 Amazing Buildings Hoxton. Now, in which case, you use a registered office address that is a virtual. Um, we do it, you can do it with us. You'd get Unit 101, the Winter Business Centre, Conway, Watford, or something like that. Um, and that costs, I think from memory, it's £100 a year. So for a fairly small fee, we will be your registered office address. For a further smelly, fairly, fairly small fee, we will be your virtual office address and we will take in post for you and we will answer the phone for you and all of that. So you can use us as a correspondence address. Accountants do it, lawyers do it, um, an awful lot of property companies do it. So if you want to keep your name and address off the public record, it's very easy to do. Uh, if, you know, if you want a, a Hoxton address, um, just so people think you're a really flash architect rather than an architect working from home, um, it's going to cost you probably 25, 30 quid a month altogether, maybe a bit less. Um, but if you don't do that, your name and address and everything else appear on the public record. Um, there's no downside to that unless you, unless there is for you. It's just one of those things. So we're registering a limited company. You choose a company name, names, address, the directors, choose a registered address, which could be your house, let's say. Work out how many shares you want to have. And here we go. First off, register limited company. You'll get a certificate of corporate income. I can't, I can't speak today. I've got a cough and I can't speak. You get a certificate of incorporation. There we go. Uh, which confirms the company legally exists and shows the company number and the date of formation. That's what the certificate of incorporation shows. And that's one of the three things that you get. You get that, you get the Articles of Association, and you get the Memorandum of Association. It used to be known as the Mem and Arts, the Memorandum of Association, the Articles of Association. Um, <clears throat> Memorandum of Association, which we'll see later, that was, I showed you briefly that one on some of the ABCD um, limited company. It's just a piece of paper that says these people have agreed to form a company, um, or this person has agreed to form a company. That's that's what it says. Um the articles, the articles of association. I might well scoot off sideways and, and and show you those later, just just for the sake of interest. But you're not expected to read them, understand them. Uh, actually, that's not true. You are expected to have read them. I think. Um, to be honest, I think most people probably don't bother because it's not a racy read. It's not up there with a good thriller. Uh, it's about eighteen pages of of less than exciting information. So you need these things, this town of birth, mother's maiden name, father's first name, telephone number. These things, these things I couldn't, it's, it's weird. When I did this and set up the screenshots, these weren't asked for. In actual fact, they do get asked for. Um, you ask three of these, way on down the process, about three quarters of the way through the incorporation process. It says the first three letters of any three of these, so the first three letters of your national insurance number, the first three letters of your father's first name, first three letters of your mother's maiden name. And that is a, a effectively an electronic signature because if everything goes wrong and it all falls apart, you can contact Companies House, give them that information, and therefore thereby proving it's you. Now, it's not foolproof because obviously anybody with a bit of research can find those things out. Um, but that's how this works. That's, that's, you know, that's how the Companies House process works for setting up a company. That's how you prove you are you. So we click register now. It says, are you starting a new application? And we say yes. Now, as with the self-assessment form, until you get to the end of this and hit submit, nothing's happened. So if, and again, I say, if you need to talk to one of us about it and you want to go through it with us, that's absolutely cool. Go right through the whole thing. And when you get to a screen that it won't let you continue unless you put information in, put any old rubbish in to get to the end. So you've been right through the process. You've put in rubbish at three points because you didn't know what to do, but you've put in something that let you carry on. Then give us a shout and one of us will go through it with you on a Zoom or something, uh, picking up the questions that you've got along the way. But remember, until you get to the very end, put your password back in and pay. Until you do that, you haven't done the company. You're partway through the process. It will save it for you and you can come back and ask questions. So, 
Are you starting a new application? Yes. And if you're going back to a safe, well, obviously you do that and it asks you to sign in again with your government gateway number and your password. Continue. Check before you start. Right. Continue to questions. Can you pay for this? If you can't, they won't let you carry on. Is anybody on the secure register? So effectively, witness protection plans or you know, the police have said this person is at risk. In those cases, your home address and your you know the address, anything to do with your home address doesn't appear on the public record, um, even if it's your registered office, I believe. So that's a very specific set of circumstances. Um, but any directors or persons with control, because the person with significant control might not be a director, almost always is. But they've just covered all bases there. So is anyone on the company's house secure register? No. So now you create a government gateway user ID, which remember is specific to the company. It's the company's government gateway account, not yours. Um, and you will need it when it's time to do the company's corporation tax return. Or unless you're using somebody else, in which case they'll need it. So if you're using a bookkeeper, they'll need it. If you're using an accountant, they'll need it. If you're doing it yourself, you've got to have your government gateway sign in. So the ID and the password, crucial. Uh, oh, by the way, just going back one, what if I need to set up multiple companies? I've never clicked that, but my assumption is it's going to say, well, you need multiple government gateway user IDs because each company has its own gateway user ID. You'll just, you know, you have to go back, back around the loop again. So you click create government gateway user ID. It says, what's your email address? You put your email address in. You enter a code. They email you a code. You put that back in, confirming your email address, then ask your full name. Then we go for, I think we go for a um, safety word, sorry, recovery word, um, get back in process word, set up a recovery for your signing details. There we go. I used custard. Make a note of this word in case you need it in the future. Uh, in fact, I don't know anybody who's used this. It must happen. Uh, but generally, you just sign back in again with your government gateway number and your password. And that takes you back to where you left off. However, you might need it in the future. It's a, They might ask you one day, you know, if, so, if they think somebody's messing about with your account, if they think something dodgy is going on, they'll say, OK, what's the recovery word? And if they still think something dodgy is going on, then they'll get down to what was your dad's middle name? What was your mum's colour of eyes? All that. Um, so set up a recovery word. We've gone with custard because we like custard. There's a government gateway ID. So that's we've got to that. We've now created a government gateway account for the limited company. They've sent it to the address, the email address. Uh, screenshot it if you want. Make a note of it. If you copy the number, not a bad idea, because if you copy the number, it just saves you remembering that number. Because at the very end, when you sign out, you've got to put that number in. So that's the gateway ID. Which email address do you want to use? The one I've just given you. I can set up a different one. Bear in mind with all of this stuff, and there is a there is a screen further on that says you cannot change this once the application is in progress. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't change it full stop. It means that uh, once you've hit go and given the money over, sometimes it takes 24 hours or so to come through. In that time period, you can't get back in and change it. So what you are registering here is what you are registering. If you want to then change the director's names and addresses, change the email address, change the shareholding, you name it, you can change it. But you can't change it in between submitting the application and Companies House emailing you back saying, here's your incorporation documents, off you go. So uh, I'll, I'll try and remember to point that out when we get to the screen, but there's a screen that says you, you, know, you can't change this process, but it only means for that tiny brief period of time. Um, so if you need a different email address or if you haven't yet set up the company's email address, which comes back to Sabina's question. So if you're doing this um, as part of your preliminaries to your setup and you haven't set up all the gear yet, that's fine. Use any old email address that you've got to set this up, bearing in mind that's the one they'll send the documentation to, and then come back into it, sign back in to your company's house account uh, and say, I'm changing the email address for this company, please. I'm changing my contact email address. And you just do it so and you can do that with most things anyway so we continue what is your relation i'm a company director click will it be a cic no i'm going no here if it will be a cic that's fine the differences are minimal 
most of the process that you're about to see also occurs with a CIC. The bit that doesn't is the association, uh, sorry, the articles of association, because a CIC doesn't have a standard set. There isn't a standard set of articles of association like there is for a limited company. There are bespoke sets, which used to mean you have to have a lawyer draw them up and it would take 30 pages of close typed documentation, uh, cost you 300 quid uh, and take several days. Actually, a CIC, I, I just mentioned this in case any of you are setting that, CIC is very straightforward to set up online. It's marginally more complicated than a straight limited company, but only marginally, because you have to have bespoke articles, which basically means there are four model sets of articles, not just one, and you open the one that suits you. It might be a... See, CICs can be either limited by shares or limited by guarantee, and they can have either a small membership or a large membership, which is number of directors, I believe. So you've got four choices. So you pick the one that suits you. You put your company name at the top of it. You save it onto your laptop and then you upload it when you're going through the process. Um, and that's the extent of the bespokeness of it. Um, but it isn't a standard click. I will accept the default set. Therefore, a CIC. And there's a, there's a couple of other minor things that are slightly different. You have to upload a form CIC 36, which is your statement of social um, purpose. Uh, th so there are things other than just the articles uh, but a cic is a slightly different process if you click yes it takes you off to that process uh, not a problem not difficult again we can do that with you if you're stuck we have a webinar on how to do a cic uh, it doesn't go through the screen by screen uh, it, it talks about how you do it and why would you do it uh, it does mention cic 36 and it does go through the screens of the it does look at the screens of the um the articles so uh it's going to be cic in this example no it's not Will it by limited by shares or limited by guarantee? So a company limited by shares is normal, let's say mainstream, let's say. Uh, limited by guarantee means you have no shares. Therefore, there is no dividend. Therefore, the directors cannot benefit from the company's activity through their shareholding. So that, that's that's a, effectively a company limited by guarantee, which is what Wenta is, by the way. A company limited by guarantee, um, you don't have the facility to make profit and distribute profit to the shareholders. Uh, any surplus the company makes through trading has to go back into the company's activities. Um, that's the law. So Wenta does not make a profit and distribute it to its shareholders. Uh, it hasn't got any shareholders. It hasn't got any shares. So any surplus Wenta makes year on year goes back into improving the premises, developing training courses, paying for the website, paying for the advisory service because it's a free advisory service, which, as you probably know, you just phone up and make appointments. We are here. Um, but we are paid with money that the company makes through its trading activity, which is the letting of premises because we've got business centers. Um, but we're limited by guarantee. So surplus money we make goes back into the business. Limited by shares, which is what most people do, means that if the company makes a profit, you as a director are entitled to decide to issue that profit to the shareholder, which is probably also you. So limited by shares is normal and mainstream. Uh, so I'm going to go, not, not the guarantee is abnormal in any way, but limited by shares is far more common. So limited by shares, click company name. Now I went monkey stuff and for some reason it went orange. Now when it goes orange, that means there is a query. I don't know what the query was. I think there's a company with, with monkey stuff somewhere in its name. But when I first put monkey stuff in, just as a made up name, um, you get this orange block around it. Now, that comes up in several circumstances. Um, there are several reasons you could have that orange block turn up. One of which is you could be naming a government department or using the word hospital or using words you can't use, words you're not allowed to use. Monkey stuff appears in somebody else's company name. So I get an orange line around it, which tells me, think carefully, this will be on hold until a person has checked it out because it's an automatic process. Um, so I changed it. Uh, I didn't change it on this slide. I changed this. Uh, I screenshotted this screen anyway, uh, but I changed it, I think, to monkey bits or something. You'll see that in a minute. So the company name goes in there. Um, I'll have limited, not LTD. Um, the other option, if I'm, and I, I can't scroll down, can I? Um, I've got a menu bar across the bottom of my screen here, but that bottom one, and I'm guessing you can see it, uh, you can have it in Welsh, which I think is Cuff and Gethig or something. 
Um, so anyway, it's in Welsh down the bottom there. Doesn't make any difference at all. It's purely how they look. You just have to pick one of them. Um, so I've got monkey stuff, the word limited. Company name is Monkey Stuff Limited. Check the company name against an existing trademark. We can click if we want to, but that's entirely up to you. What company name ending would you like? LTD, tick, sorry, I've scrolled down so you can actually see it. Then you hit save and continue there. Company's registered office address. I don't want my home address to be publicly available. Okay, then you need to register with somebody like us, your accountant, a lawyer, shop around a bit on the internet looking for virtual addresses. The company has to have a registered office address. It's a legal requirement. It's its legal address. It is the document, it is the address at which documents may be served. So you can use a business address, a home address, as long as it's in the UK. You can use rented accommodation. I believe you can use rented accommodation as long as you have the permission of whoever actually owns it. Um, it is, uh, it, used to be, it used to be much more normal than it is now. Um, practice to put the company name on a little plate outside the uh, the business. Uh, here at Winter, here in Watford, in our reception area, um, there are ooh, 60, 70, 80 company names on little little plates in a long string, to, or two or three long strings next to each other, um, in, on display in reception, uh, because we are obliged to display companies for whom we are the registered office address and we've also got on the other side of the doorway um, the addresses of the people on this site all the businesses on this site the, na the names of them um, but if somebody is being the registered office for a company that address is supposed to display the fact that it is a registered office address in in actual point of fact most people who use their home addresses do not put a plate outside the door I think the regulation is that you have to have it clearly displayed. So if someone comes in the front door, they should be able to see clearly that this is the registered office of, of a company. But again, I, I, I really don't know that many people do that. Um, office buildings do. Obviously, it looks the part. But people's people t tend not to do it so much in their houses. You don't go into people's living rooms and suddenly find a plaque on the wall saying, this is the registered office of ABCDEF Limited. Um, however, you have to have a registered office address for the company. Um, and it can be us or it can be someone like us. Uh, you put the postcode in and the property name and find the address. That's the registered office address. Uh, I've gone 103 High Street, Hemel Hempstead. Confirm and continue. So I've picked an address. Confirm that. Where will it be registered? Now, this isn't where the address, because it's, no, yeah, it's Monkey Bits Notice because Monkey Stuff was taken by somebody else. It, it was part of their name. Um, interestingly, with the, the names thing, if part of your company name looks a bit like the acronym for a government department, they'll put it on hold until they've checked it out. Um, this happened with a company, uh, it was about seven or eight years ago, a lady setting up uh, a children's clothing company. It was called Rawberry, R-O-A-R-B-E-R-R-Y, Rawberry. And the logo was a little lion. Uh, and I'm not giving any secrets away here. She registered the company, so it's, it's public domain stuff. You know, I'm not giving away confidential information. Um, but she registered the company and as part of the registration, we, we did it together because she hadn't done it before and wanted, wanted to sit with somebody to do it. Um, and we got the yellow, the yellow line all the way around it. Uh, it went on hold. And the reason it went on hold and after about, I think it was 24 hours, they contacted her and said, that's fine. Carry on. We went right through the process and left it on, left it. And they came through and said, that's okay. We've processed your application. Um, because, uh, there was a government department, probably still is, um, Business Education and Regulatory Reform, B-E-R-R. -R. That was the acronym for the Business Education and Regulatory Reform Department. I think that's what it was. Um, and those four letters were together in Rawberry. Uh, and because the algorithm in their computer had picked up those four letters in a block, it said, stop now. You're passing yourself off as a government department. We need to check out who you are. And they checked it out and it was fine. But just to let you know, that can happen. So if you do get your company name snagged effectively by company's house, it might well be that it's not a problem at all. They've just automatically snagged it because of a sequence of letters. Um, there was the same thing happened about two years ago. Somebody was setting up and it had the Welsh word for Duke <laughs> purely by accident in, in, in the company name. 
in part of the name. I can't remember what the word was. Um, and again, you can't use words like duke and earl and prince. There are a lot of words you cannot use unless you're allowed to, unless you are a duke or an earl or you have a special dispensation. Hospital, cancer, charity. There's lots of words you can't use. Um, so anyway, now we have where will the company registered, England and Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales. These are different things. Um, and depending on, does it matter? Not really. But if you're in England and Wales, why wouldn't you? Um, Scottish company law is slightly different. I don't know exactly in what regard, but I do know that back in the day, if somebody, if you were suing somebody in Scotland, you had to go to Scotland um, because I know somebody who did it. They were chasing somebody for money and it went to law uh, and they had to have the case heard in Edinburgh. So be aware. Um, this may be relevant. <clears throat> Generally speaking, you just tick wherever it is that you're basically registered, where the registered notice. So if you're a Welsh company trading in England uh, with an English registered address, you tick that. If you're Scottish, but you've got an English registered address, you tick that because it's about the registered address. Save and continue. What's its principal place of business? And I've gone same address as I use for the registered office because for most people, that's what it's going to be. Um, but if you're using uh, a virtual, you would click that and put, well, because you could easily have three, three addresses on the go here. Your registered office could be one thing. Your principal place of business could be another thing because you've got an industry unit somewhere where you make stuff. Um, and then you've got the director's service address as well. So that's the uh, principal place of business and the registered office. So we go save and continue. Uh, contact details. Um, one or more. So I left the email address in. Um, you can put a mobile number in, another contact number in. So just you know, just to make sure you're contactable, I guess. Save and continue. Is it replacing another business? So if you're buying another company, if you're changing from sole trader to limited company, uh, you're replacing another business. Um, in which case you need to tick yes. If you are changing from sole trader to a limited company, there is a bit of process involved. Check it out. Um, I read it through for somebody about six months ago. It's not it's not rocket science difficult, but you need to do it right because you're going to stop operating as a sole trader, start operating as a limited company, and you need to make sure you do it by the rules. Um, it's very clear. There's, there's information on how to do it. It's very common. People do it a lot. This might be why, again, coming back to Sabina's question way back, this might be that you're operating as a sole trader, starting operating as a limited company, and you need to know how to do it you know, right and do it by the rules on the day that you want to. Um, because a lot of people operate as a sole trader, they register the company, don't trade through it. So it's there when they want it, if they do decide they want to operate as a limited company. Um, and in that instance, you would have to tick the box yes there. Uh, and it'll say, what is the, limit, uh, the sole trader business you're replacing? So, so if we continue, <clears throat> this. Um, this is the one, again, following on from Spinner's question. Um, when will it start trading? Now, sometime in the future, if you tick that, you get a drop down box that says, what's the date you're going to be trading then? And I'm not planning on trading yet. Those are the three choices. Uh, and it's entirely up to you which ones you do. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing the setup now um, and saying, I'm going to start trading on the 1st of I don't know, January. Uh, that's fine. So I'm registering the company now. My first tax year starts on the 1st of January. Therefore, my first tax year ends on the 31st of December next year. Therefore, my first tax return will be due. Companies have corporation tax returns due nine months after the end of their year. Um, so that's when your first CT return will be due. If your completed application is approved, which, to be honest, is quite unusual for them not to be, uh, very unusual you'll get a letter explaining how to tell hmrc yeah. when the company becomes active so if you say i'm not going to trade through this just now and i believe they also do it there as well on a different they say okay uh, if you give them a date they'll expect you to start trading on that date unless you tell them different um, when you start trading you don't actually have any interface with hmrc with the tax people um, for corporation tax with companies house about your returns, none of that happens. All of that becomes relevant after the end of your first year. So your your job, same as if you're a um, single person, self-employed type business, your job is from the date of incorporation and from previous to that with all your setup costs, 
from the date of incorporation and all your setup costs and the pre-trading costs to keep good records. That's your job. Because come the end of the year, midnight on the last day of the year, your tax year ends. You've now got to do a tax return uh, to Companies House and to HMRC. You don't have to do two tax returns. You, you log into um, HMRC through the government gateway. You go into the government gateway for the company. You say, I want to do my corporation tax return. It says here you are, then and off you go. And you enter a lot of information into HMRC. Um, and HMRC give Companies House the information they need. So it's, it's, it's a single port um, through the government gateway. Uh, but anyway, that's that's the sort of when am I going to start trading question that we mentioned before. Save and continue. Now, I'll just do this one and then I'm going to go and take a 10 minute break and get some more water. See if I can stop myself coughing. Uh, in the first three months, is the company going to do any of these things? Pay interest on non-bank loans. Make royalty payments. Or receive interest or dividend payments from overseas. Generally speaking, no. Um, I've helped people say helped sat with people whilst they set up limited companies quite a lot. Nobody's ever ticked anything except no. Uh, this one is the, the interesting one, paying interest on non-bank loans. Because what that's for, if you're planning on, tell us if it will pay interest on non-bank loans. Are you planning on borrowing your own money from the company? So a loan to a director with interest. So if I've lent the company money to get it started, I've put £10,000 in to get it started. Is it going to have to pay me back with an interest rate of 100%? Because that's the next question. If it's going to pay interest, how much? Because that, for example, if I put £10,000 in to start the business as a loan, and then I take £10,000 back out plus £10,000 interest, so an interest rate of 100%, HMRC would be jolly interested in that because that's clearly a scam to avoid paying myself salary. Um so that's why they're asking. They're asking because the company are lending you money and you, sorry, you lending the company money and charging the company interest on it um, is a way of you taking money out of the company, possibly um, not paying the tax you should. And that's why they ask that question. Uh, no is much more common, as I say. Um, it is best to speak to an accountant. If you, yeah, if you yeah it might be best to speak from the accountant that's entirely up to you if you've got strange things like company loans into company loans buying buildings and loaning each other if you've got complicated stuff going on speak to someone find find someone who understands that game because it's very important right i am now going to take a 10 minute break um i'll switch off the mic and i'll be back in 10 have a coffee or a break or whatever uh, and I'll be back with you in a minute. Right.
So, whoops. We've done the, will the company be doing any of these things? Uh, and, and it won't. Uh, the next thing is, what's the company going to do? What is it going to do? Uh, and these are the SIC codes. And you type the beginning of what it does in the box. And it offers you the best it can think of. Um, an awful lot of people, there's one, I can't remember the number of it, there's uh, a class which is other, other professional activities not elsewhere classified, I think it is. Uh, and that's pretty much everybody who's a consultant, who's, you know, it's very widely used. <clears throat> These things, don't get bound up in them, don't worry too much, because they're not asking, you know, you're a you're a car dealer, well, do you sell, what exactly what cars do you sell? Do you sell Fords? Okay, what years Fords do you sell? They, they don't, that's not what they want to know. They want to know you're in the motor trade. So it's general. They want to know, are you, for example, looking to export radioactive materials to questionable overseas agents? They, they just want a general indication of what you're going to do. And there are four SIC codes that you can use. So if, if you decide that one of them is the manufacture of professional arcade games and toys, and also other professional scientific and technical activities not elsewhere classified, that and activities, and you, you've got a membership organization as well. So you're making arcade toys, you're operating as a consultant in the geology sector, and you're running a membership organization for the local business community. You'd click all three of those, and it would be 32401, 74909, and 94120. If you click that, it takes you to the SIC database. This is SIC, Standard Industrial Classification, SIC code. Um, so if you can't find it, it takes you to the, the SIC code database, which is massive. There's everything you can think of. And that, that's where it does get down to. It's okay, you're making T-shirts. Are you making T-shirts out of cotton, out of wool, out of other materials? Have they got leather designs on them? Are they printed? Are they embossed? There's, there's zillions of, of activities. And they just want a general indication. So they want something like this. This is the next screen. Business activity, manufacture of bricks, tiles, and construction products in baked clay. There you go. That's what they want to know. Broadly what you're doing. Now, if you just put one in, that's fine. You can add another one and you can have four. You can go back into this once you've incorporated and gone through and it's, you know, it's approved your application and you're in. You can come back into this and change it and add things and delete things. It's general information and it should be current and correct um, of what your company is doing. Um, so it's, it's partly statistics gathering and partly just making sure they know what you're doing because you're a public thing you're a limited company this isn't this isn't a toy this isn't a secret thing this is a limited company under the laws of the uk um so part of what you do has to be visible so check and confirm what your company will be doing confirm and continue again have you sent a secure register form off or anybody else asking for protection so company directors or persons in significant control, um, either of those, are they on the secure register? Nope. Oh, I've done that one. This is the follow on. So I'll just go back a screen there. Save and continue. Um, there's a follow on. Uh, oh, bear with me. Fair enough. Um, right, has the direct, oops, has anyone asked for the secure register? No. Has the director used a different name? No. The director is British, date of birth of the director, job title, director. Save and continue. What's the correspondence address? So that was the residential address, correspondence address. Again, you've got this, I don't want my home address to be publicly available, in which case it'll say, well, go and use a virtual then, you'll have to find one. Um, that or a different address. And if I tick a different address, it'll say, what is it? And what is the home address? This is the one that doesn't appear on the public record. So the home address isn't shown on, on, on your record on company's house. There's the home address. 
Do I want to receive filing reminders by email? Yes, please. Filing reminders are where they'll tell you that your corporation tax return is due. Now, they tell you, they give you a lot of notice for it. So if your year is, say your year is on the government year, it's April to, to April. So your year starts on April the 1st, finishes on March the 31st. That's your company's year. So if the company finishes its year March 31st, the tax return is due April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Last day of December is the deadline. So it's due any time from when the year starts. So when from that nine month period starts to the end of that nine month period. So you've got nine months after the end of your year to get your corporation tax return done. Now, do you want to receive a filing reminder? Yes, please. They'll send you a filing reminder in that example. So your tax year ends on the 31st of March. They'll probably send you a reminder sometime during April to say, and it, it'll it'll be a strange one because it'll make you jump. The first time you see it, it'll make you jump because you'll get a reminder, possibly in the post, possibly by email, depending on how you've chosen to have it. You get a reminder and it says, you are now required and it's quite heavy. It's it's almost like you are required by law to get online and submit your corporation tax return and, uh, and words to that effect. And that's absolutely true because you are liable for a corporation tax return from midnight on 31st of March because your year has ended. And after your year is ended, you must send a corporation tax return in. However, the deadline for doing that is December the 31st. So when they send you a letter in let's say mid-April, that says you are now liable for a corporation tax return. You must submit this, et cetera, et cetera. The deadline for it is the following December, end of the following December. But they send the reminder out good and early. Um, so do you want to receive filing reminders by email? Yes, please. And they will send me filing reminders by email. To which email address? And I can ask for another one, a different one. Right, so what's the correspondence address? This is a summary of the previous four screens. I confirm this, and I confirm that this person has agreed to become a director of the company. So that's a legal statement. So we've now set up the company and told them who the directors are, or the director is, uh, and next is the shareholders, which is probably going to be the same person might be two or three of them and they might not all be shareholders. So this is where you sort out who's holding shares, who's a director and not a shareholder, who's a shareholder and not a director, whatever. If it's a single person company, it's you. It's easy. You're the only director. You're the only shareholder. That's it. So to set up the company's shareholders, you need a few things. You need to know the value for the shares, how many shares you want to give them and who they are and, and all of that. Save and continue. Moving on. Is this person a shareholder? Now, this is handy because when this before the nice, tidy online system came about, there was a clunky online system where it didn't remember what you put in. So having put the name and address in three times for the person owning the company, you've then got to go through it all again, telling them it's a shareholder because they'll say, OK, what's this person's address? <coughs> Excuse me. But now... If I say, yes, this person is a shareholder, having established that this person is also a director, this, this person is a shareholder, save and continue. Would you like to add another shareholder? No. So it's just the one. And they know the details. This is automatic. If you want to add another shareholder, no problem. Just going back one. No, you click yes, and it says who? Name, address, uh, contact details, email address. Uh, so barring that, you say no, and they confirm the shareholder's name, the shareholder's address. Is that correct? Yes, confirm and continue. What sort of shares do you want to use? The most common type of shares are ordinary shares. If you want to use something complicated, take advice because you need to get it right. If you want somebody to have voting rights, but no rights to dividend and things like that, make sure you do it right. As I said before, we are generalists. We know we can help you with the process, but if you want specific advice on share ownership, who owns what, what rights they have, if it's non-standard, standard is all shares are the same. Everybody, the, the, the statement used to appear on the, the old 
uh, I think it's on the, the printed form still, uh, all shares have equal rights as to voting and dividend. So as when it comes to splitting the money, you've got equal shares, depending on how many shares you've got, that's how much you get. Uh, and um, so you've got equal rights to dividend and equal rights to voting, which normally is one share, one vote. So most companies use ordinary shares, um, which gives you one vote per share and a share of the profits. Maybe if it shuts down a share of the capital, if it's if it's wound up and there's any money left. Uh, but that's again, that's that's fairly unusual. So only choose no if you need to create more than one type of share. Otherwise, tick yes. Just use I'm going to use standard ordinary shares. Yes, I'm going to move on with that. And as the only shareholder, this person will own 100% of the company, regardless of how many shares you choose. So we'll have 100. Why not? Uh, it's probably worth having more than one because if somebody wants to invest money in the company and you want to give them shares, you can't sell them shares. You, you can't sell shares without being um, registered on the financial markets. You have to be uh, publicly quoted. However, you can exchange shares for equity. So if they put 20 grand into the business and you give them 10 shares, that's up to you uh, and that might work. But you have to have 10 shares to give them. So you'd have 100 shares, you'd give them 10. You've still got control, you still own the business but they have um, some rights to the profit because they've given you some money to put into it. Question. Oh, uh, well, the maximum number of shares, JC. Do you know, I don't know. I've got a suspicion it's 10,000. I've got a suspicion it's 10, but it's it's enormous. I mean, basically, why would you? Um, you, you may as well have 100, because if you get 100 backers, you give them a share each. Um, I don't know what the maximum is but it's high. Um, and bear in mind, each share is valued at a pound. Generally speaking, you don't put money in. You have to pay up the shares if you sell the business. Um, what people tend to do is this whole process is nominal. So there are 100 shares or 200 or 500 or most common numbers are 110 shares. So there are 100 shares and um, they're split between three directors, let's say. Uh, which makes for an interesting number of shares. Uh, they will be nominally valued at a pound each. Normally, you can value them at what you like, but nominally a pound each, why wouldn't you? Um, and that makes life very simple. So we've decided this company is going to have 100 shares. Save and continue. Choose a value for each share. If you click other, you can have 17p, £2.48, anything you like. Why wouldn't you have a pound? But you can have what you like. Save and continue. Then, how many shares does this person own? 100. Because they know, the, the, um, the process that we're in now, knows there's one shareholder, knows there's one director, because we've told it that. It knows there's 100 shares, because we've told it that. It knows they're each worth a pound, because we've told it that. It has therefore made the assumption that there's only one shareholder, therefore that person holds all the shares and that's their value. This bit will assume that each shareholder has paid the value of their shares to the company. If they haven't, they'll need to do so. And generally speaking, that gets left until the company changes hands or something major happens. Um, it tends to stay as a virtual thing, as a nominal thing. So company shares... Yes, you can edit or remove shareholders. So you could change the existing shareholder or take them away. You can add them in. You can add share types with different values. Uh, that's where it gets slightly complicated. Uh, this is a summary. The company has a total of 100 shares with a total value of £100. That's the shareholding page, basically. And then there's the PSC. Um, because the information we've already given... Uh, is pretty much indicative of who's going to control the thing. Um, we know some information about the company's person of a sig person with significant control. That's what it's saying. Um, person with a, a PSC is an individual or a company. So the company, remember, a company can be a shareholder. A company, um, a company is a legal entity. You're bringing into existence a legal entity in law. It can hold shares in other companies. It can do stuff. Uh, it can enter into contracts. I mean, you control it. 
and you sign on its behalf. You sign as a director of the company, but you are not it. So it, it gets into contracts. Uh, it pays people. It invoices. It has a bank account. And it is controlled by somebody. Uh, and you're probably it. And the person with significant control is an individual or a company that has at least one of the following. So the, 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 if it's a company that's a director of a company, uh, I think that's called a corporate director. That is not a director of a company. That is a company being a director of a company, a corporate director. And a natural director is a person being a director of a company. Anyway. A PSC has more than 25% of the company's shares and voting rights. In actual fact, it's quite clear that this single person company has all the shares and all the voting rights. So they know that this person is it because from the previous answers, there are no other shareholders. So they know that this person is the one with the control because there isn't anybody else in the business. <coughs> Uh, and yes, this person can remove directors, uh, appoint them and remove them. Here's a summary of what we've said. I confirm that the person named here in control understands their information will be listed in the public record. Notice that. Remember, we said that this is public information and that anybody who's searching on Company's House can find your information and look at it. That's how it works. Um, you're not being treated oddly. Everybody on Company's House who is a company director has got their details up there yeah. or their contact details at least. So we've confirmed the address. We've confirmed the person in control of the company. And then we hit save and continue. This is the Model Articles of Association link. Do you want to use model articles? And if you say no, it'll say, okay, upload the bespoke ones then. Because model articles are a standard set that you can use, which makes incorporating a business in the UK very quick. They didn't work very well um, when they were being drawn up by lawyers and things because they were inconsistent i guess i guess it was you know depending on who was drawing them up they may have had minor changes in there um so this having got a default set in place i tell you what i will just to keep you all excited i will show you default articles there we go default model articles <laughs> Model articles for private companies limited by shares, click. And this is it. So when you're going through the process, and we'll go back to uh, screenshots in a second, when you're going through the process, it says, I accept the model. I, 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 I choose to use the model articles. And this is what it is. Part one is defined terms, liability of members. Part two, directors. Da, 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 da. Part three, decision making by directors. Part four, appointment of directors. Shares and distributions, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how it goes. Note that a limited liability company, this is what the limit of liability is. The liability of the members of the company is limited to the amount unpaid on the shares held by them. So effectively, if you've got a hundred pound company and you haven't paid any of the money in, your liability for bad stuff happening, for the company getting things wrong and causing problems, your liability is a hundred pounds. That won't save you from criminal activity or health and safety breaches. Um, but that's technically that's the case, but it won't save you from stupid stupidness and uh, unnecessary risks and bad things. Part two, directors, general authority, reserve powers, directors may delegate. Uh, this is basically the rules of the game. And it goes on and on and on. On and on. We're halfway through. So just so as you know, that's what the default set is. Uh, and you can find it as a Word doc or as a PDF. <coughs> and when you're, there we go. So the model articles of association, that, clicking that, obviously not on a screen grab, um, 
that takes you to that if you want to read it and check it. it hasn't got your company name in it's an absolute standard model set and remember i said about cic's that's if you, you you download there's four for cic you choose one of them that fits you best and you put your company name in it whereas this one is an absolutely standard set you don't put your company name in or anything you just click a box to say i will use the model articles yes if you click no it says okay use your own upload them here please uh, that's no problem people do that uh, not quite sure why you would but you, you can so do you want to use model articles yep Save and continue. So we've seen the Articles of Association. That's that. We've seen what the Memorandum of Association looks like. If you remember, it was that piece of paper that says this person has agreed to form a company. Uh, and the Certificate of Incorporation is the third piece of sort of legality. Uh, and that's the third thing that they send you by email once your application to form a company has been approved. So do you want to use model articles? Yes. Moving on. Do you agree to form the company? That's the Memorandum of Association. Uh, and it will say, this person has agreed to form a limited company. And if there's six of you, it'll have six signatures on it, for example. Um, you'll be sent the official version by email once you've registered. So that's that. And you confirm that the person here named has agreed to form the company, as stated, in accordance with the law. So you check and confirm your answers. Last bit. Company details, company contact, company takeover, all the things here. And moving on down the screen, bottom part of the screen, uh, what's the director's name, date of birth, address details, shares, value of the shares, uh, and more information about the person. So your answers show that the person has the following control. This person holds more than 75% of the shares in the company. So that person has the, the control, basically. So that, again, this is the bit I meant when I said, when it says here, I understand this um, registration cannot be changed after I proceed. It doesn't mean forever. So when I click proceed, it means until this is approved, you can't go back in and change it. Um, and that'll probably be 24 hours. I think they reserve the right for it to be 48 hours, I think. Um, but normally, if you do want it in the morning, you probably get it through later, later that day. Um, it, normally, it's within 24 hours. So you tick that box saying, I understand the registration application can't be changed after I proceed and until they send me the documents through and I've got the company and then I can change anything I like. Confirm and send application. <laughs> Didn't tick the box, so it comes up in red. And that's it. That's the limited company. So I'll just go back to, yeah. So setting a company up, very straightforward. You can have a look at the articles. You can have a look at the memorandum of association, but if you are going to do it, Go through it yourself, bearing in mind um, when it says, do you want to use model articles? And I go, save and continue. Do you agree to form the company? Save and continue. The next page, which is, sorry, go through those. There, there. I confirm I understand it can't be changed. I click go. That screen would be the one that says, give us your debit card or give us your PayPal account. Uh, and they charge you 12 quid and you've got a limited company. Just in passing, um, the reasons you might form a limited company, money, because you will be slightly less taxed than you would be as a sole trader, depending on the level of income in the business. So there's a point low down the scale where there's almost nothing in it. Um, it's worth doing the sums because you can work out how much income you'll get and what your tax bill will be. But by the time you get up to taking 30, 35,000 pounds a year out of the business, it's probably worth being a limited company just about. So money, there is risk. Uh, a reason to form a limited company is that the company takes the risk you don't. Remember I said that the limit of liability uh, was £100 or whatever it was, so, you know, it's a share value. That is the limit of your risk. Unless you do something stupid, illegal, dangerous, in contravention of health and safety law, any of that stuff. But if you're just unlucky, your insurance should cover you. 
but it's the company that gets sued, not you. This is why people put their house in people's names and they, they take their assets out of the business and put it in somebody else's name if they're sole traders. Because if you're a sole trader, something goes badly wrong, it's you. It's personal. Your money is the business's money. It will The business will come home to roost uh, and the problem will be your problem. <clears throat> Whereas limited company, it is not you. So if it gets into dead trouble or it's being sued for something, unless you've done something really stupid or illegal, that's where it stops. So the company being sued is where it stops. So if the company is insured, it gets sued, it pays out, you're good. Um, at worst, it gets sued, it can't pay out, it goes bust. But as long as you've done nothing illegal or, or negligent or in breach of health and safety law, you personally are probably insulated from the risk, probably. Now, there's two reasons, money and risk to form a limited company. Other reasons are to save the name, just so nobody else can have it. So just incorporate the company and leave it dormant. Say, I am not planning on trading through this. So you leave it dormant until you do want it. Um, and the last two are perception. People form limited companies just because it looks right. For their type of business, in their type of market, a limited company is the thing to do, in which case form a limited company and trade through it. Um, and the last one is your customers. Uh, it may be that your customers would rather deal with a limited company than a sole trader. Uh, most local authorities do this. As far as I know, all the London boroughs do it. Um, they'll deal with you as a sole trader, if you're as a self-employed sole trader, uh, as distinct from a limited company. If you're mending their fuses, maintaining their buildings, cutting their lawns, all that. But they won't subcontract work to you. So if you're a trainer and you want to train the businesses on their industrial estate under contract. So the council is providing free training to the industrial estate uh, and you're the deliverer. They won't give you the contract if you're a sole trader. They'll insist you be a limited company. I don't know why, but all councils do this. So if, if you're delivering services on behalf of a council to that council's um, rate payers or voters or whatever you want to call them, you will need to be a limited company because councils won't let you do it if you're not. Um, that's just a thing. So your clients might force you into it. So the five reasons to form a limited company are money, risk, your clients, perception, and just saving the name so nobody else can have it. Those are the main reasons people form limited companies. So that's the end of the application there. Um, the blank screen there is the last screen on the um, in the process. Uh, just to say, and I will put in the chat, if I can find the chat. Sorry, it's gone off again. There we go. I will just put in the chat so everybody knows 01438 310020. That is the number to call to make an appointment with any one of us for a Zoom or a phone or an in person meeting. So if you want to do the limited company thing and want to just sit with somebody else while you do it, um, you know, we can help you with the process. Yeah, give us a bell. Uh, Leandro or Karen will put you in one of our diaries and we will help you with the process. We'll help you any way we can. Right, that's, yeah, so we finished a little bit this side of four o'clock, but that's cool. If I register the company, <laughs> yeah, I think I've heard that too, Sabina. Um I would buy the domain names as soon as I would buy the domain names. I'd buy, I, yeah. I mean, it's it's it, it's personal preference. But if it was me, if I was registering um, Monkey Bits Limited, I would buy MonkeyBits.co.uk, MonkeyBits.com, and Monkey Bits on uh, Insta, Facebook, TikTok, and Reddit, and possibly X. Um, so yeah, I believe there are. Because if they buy the you know if you if, if they buy the company name you've got to buy it off them because domain name well they can't buy a domain name actually you rent domain names but yeah I would I would I would quickly register the domain names <laughs> because so that's the also you'll find um, because this whole thing there's a thing called the London Gazette the London Gazette used to be a broadsheet newspaper you know back in the day when people wore tall hats and people wrote with quill pens um, the, the London Gazette was a broadsheet paper. And in the London Gazette, it was linked to Company's House. It's basically the, the uh, official organ of Company's House. Um, in the London Gazette goes 
this person has just formed a new company. This person has resigned as a director. These three people have formed a new company and they are, these are the shareholding they've set up. All the public information stuff is listed in the London Gazette. And when it was a broadsheet paper, you had to buy it and read through it and all the rest of it. Now, <coughs> sorry, it's a searchable database. Consequently, be aware that when you form a new limited company, you will get a flurry of people writing to you saying, you should be, you, you, you get proper scams. It is a legal requirement that your company be on this database. The fee is only £38.50 and you'll get all that stuff. Um, so the, you'll get scams telling you that you need to incorporate your funds for their membership into your plans for the next five years and all that. You'll get lots of that. Um, if in doubt, look online, put put the details online and say, is this a scam? Because Google usually is pretty good at it. Um, and also you'll get people saying, we now own this domain name. Because if it's a cool company name, um, it's searchable. They'll find it and they'll register the domains and then try and sell them back to you. So I would do the whole thing in one swoop. So once you, once you know you've got the company name, I would register the domains immediately um, because, yeah. How true it is that they actually search the thing, I don't know. My bet is there is an algorithm that searches for new limited companies and the director's details to do that. Yes, you can. Uh, you're registering a company by agent, okay? Uh, it's easy to do it yourself and it's cheaper usually, but yeah, that's cool. Because um, everybody, the company's house is the only way you can register a company. So if you're using an agent, um, they will be doing it with company's house for you. But yes, you can contact Wenta. If you give us a bell, our phone number here... Ah, I've got to remember our phone number here now. Oh, well, depending on where you are. Um, I, yeah, I would, right, depending on where you are, JC, um, Stevenage or here in Watford or, you know, whichever of our places is nearest for you. But, you know, we here in Watford, doesn't make any odds to us, but Watford can be your registered office if you're trading in Glasgow or Lewisham. Cool. Uh yeah, I mean, I would I ring us because we haven't got we haven't got anywhere in Lewisham, you know, we haven't got anywhere in that side of London. So yeah, by all means, give us a shout. Um, number is I'll stick it in the chat. Um, if you come through to, um, hold on a second, type message here. What? I'm clicking stuff and weird things are happening here. Um, No, I cannot remember the direct line in. Bear with me, I'm searching. Doobie doobie doobie. There it is, 247373. Uh, if you phone 01923 247373, that comes straight through to the property side of the business centre here in Watford, and they will take your details, send you a form to fill in. Um, and I think it's something like it. 10 12 it's about 12 quid a month or something it's a monthly it's a monthly fee um, but they'll tell you what it is and if you want to go ahead they'll sort it out with you but if you phone that number the 01923 247373 um, they will sort you out and, and set you up with a, a, a virtual registered office address no problemo uh... Yeah, trying to think of anything else. No, that's about it, really. Can't think of anything else that's massively helpful for the limited company setup thing. Um, like I say, give us a shout if you want somebody to walk it through with you. We'll help if we can. Um, keep in touch because maybe one day there will be some funding, in which case hopefully it will come through us, in which case we can um, distribute funding to small businesses because every now and again that happens. Uh, at the moment, there's the squeak. So... Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you for listening. If you've been watching on catch up or watching in the evening whilst you're doing something else, that's cool. Thank you very much for taking the time to do that as well. Um, hope it was useful. Um, yeah, all the very best with it. Look at the other webinars. I'm sure you have. There's lots of webinars that should be useful. The obvious one that follows on from this is the um, self-assessment one. We've also got a corporation tax preparation as well. Like it's not corporation tax it is these are screens you will see when you go through the process so uh yes thank you natalie thank you for the kind words uh it's my pleasure sorry about the coughing along the way that's inescapable at the moment um well, there we go right so uh oh lucy winch has raised a hand no lucy hasn't raised a hand this is tricky because when i see when i see hands raised i just got a thing up there said you raised a hand so i'm guessing you haven't um but yeah thank you all very much uh, 
Yeah. And th yeah, thanks for the questions as well. Sensible questions. And uh, without the questions, I tend to forget stuff. So very useful. Thank you all. I'm going to probably stop sharing now. All being well. <laughs> all right. <laughs> no worries, Lucy. It confuses me because I, I looked and there isn't a, a, isn't a little yellow hand there. And I thought, ah, I've done something wrong. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm now going to... Oh, right. I'll start the video. There we go. That's me starting the video. So thanks very much. Bye, everybody. Stop in sharing now. And uh, yeah, all the very best of luck with it all. Thanks a lot.